following instructions in case of an emergency. First, please take a moment to know where your exits are. Hmm. If an emergency arises that prompts you to evacuate, please exit this room in a quick and orderly manner through one of the two exterior doors, one to your right and the other behind you. Once you exit the building, we ask that you safe to cross Granville Street to our parking lot to be safely away from the building. Our staff will help provide additional direction and assistance. In the case of a tornado warning, we ask that you exit this room into the hallway where we will all remain until it is safe to exit. In the event of an active shooter in the building, if there is an accessible escape path, run and try to evacuate the premises. If you can't evacuate, please find a place to hide where you are less likely to be found and lock any doors that you can. As a last resort, and only if your life is in imminent danger, fight. Our staff will provide additional assistance on what to do. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Gentlemen, our Father, we give thanks for you giving in the handiwork of the rain. We appreciate all that you do for us and helping us to live a normal life. Let's now this meeting that we might do the things pleasing in thy sight. Make decisions that affect the good of our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Received in your agenda package, the minutes of the previous meeting, the minutes of your book approval on the two meetings. Any additions or corrections? If not, if not, most of the group. Second. Question. All in favor, let me know my vote is aye. Aye. All opposed. Here, now the minutes are approved. Schedule appointments. Mr. Evans. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first on the agenda tonight, the scheduled appointments is regarding uh, NEED's annual application for funding, also known as their anti-poverty plan. Uh, the National Ishtone Economic Development Incorporated, the NEED Incorporated, received federal funding through the Community Service Block Grant Program. The requirement of the program is to present their application for funding, which is their anti-poverty plan, to the Board of Commissioners in each county they serve. This plan discusses their strategies for eliminating poverty within their service area. A copy of the plan is included in your agenda package. No action is needed of you. The need incorporated is required to distribute a copy of the plan to you prior to its submission. You're also able, uh, you're also to be given an opportunity to submit your comments along with the plan. Representatives from me are uh, present tonight uh, to answer any questions that you might have. I believe we have. Um, thank you so much for getting us on the agenda. Um, I do want to say there's been a couple of updates. The first update that we will be submitting to this application is our board, our board officers. Our board officers recently changed due to Ms. Stacy Chasser becoming the board, becoming the county, county manager for Nash County. In order to keep the appearance of any conflict of interest, she stepped down as the board chair and we had elections January 27th meeting. And at that meeting, we now have new officers. Ms. Cheryl Forbes, who is our vice chair, she will be um, doing the remaining term for Ms. Stacy. Ms. Viola Harris is now our vice chair. And um, so that was the major change. So that is a change that will have to be addressed in this application. Were there any questions about the overview? Uh, we have the, the plan in our agenda based on your review of that plan. Do you have any questions for them? Or do you have the things that you need to specifically highlight to us? Um, well, specifically, I would like to highlight that um, first we have changed our name. Our name is now Nash Edge Home Goods and Community Action. Um, it is official in all of our documents now. So that is our new name moving forward. Nash Edge Home Wilson Community Action. So it's no longer needed. No longer needed. Mr. Woody, our um, CSB direct, director, will give you an overview of just of what we've done this year. And please be mindful that our end of the year four OEO and the CSBG grant is June 30th, 2022. So we still have this quarter and the remaining last quarter to meet some of our outputs. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, as Ms. Cole stated, I just wanted to give you guys um, a little um, update on some of the outcomes that we do have this year. Um, so we uh, we're running our work plan to serve 100 clients uh, for our fiscal year, fiscal year this year, and uh, we're actually at 103. Um, the number of low participant families rising from poverty. We had a goal of 20 right now. We're at 12, which is amazing. Um, the number of participant families attending employment was 30. Right now we're at 26. Um, due to individuals going back to work to COVID, we were able to get a lot of um, clients employed this year. Um, versus last year, we had a struggle for that, but this year we've seen a lot of turnaround in uh, income and employment for our clients. Uh, the number of participant families who are employed and obtain better employment was 30. Um, that was our goal, and right now we're at 17. Um, the number of jobs with medical benefits obtained, our goal was 15, and we're at 8. And the number of participant families completing education training programs is 30. Uh, that number is our lowest number for our outcomes. Uh, we're at 10 right now. Um, main reason uh, a lot of our clients are really trying to get back to work and uh, get some income in their household. So, uh, we're, putting, uh, we're, we're, we're keeping that in mind as we're having people come in that are expressing uh, interest in education and employment as well. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Um, well, uh, <laughs> and it's pretty much the same one I had last year around the strategic plan. I noticed you're still working on that 18, that um, 2018 was the last one within the Yes, ma'am. So this is our last year within this fiscal year, our fiscal grant. So it, nothing has changed. So we're each grant period is for three year three year process. Okay. So this is our last year within that three year process. Okay. So you don't have to do exactly. a strategic plan for every three years. Is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. For OEM. For OEM. So we are now currently working with our community needs assessment. We have a um, consultant who is helping us. We have a survey link on our website if anyone wants to go on our website and do a survey. And as soon as we get the data from that and start the survey, then we'll start the strategic plan. Any you know, other questions or comments? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. The next uh, schedule appointment is the Twin County Opioid Settlement Committee. As you know, a settlement was reached on the nationwide opioid litigation. The National Association of Counties, along with the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, crafted a settlement agreement for our state where funds will be provided directly to the county. These funds can be used for a number of opioid remediation activities. The Twin County Opioid Settlement Committee is a group of partners working to elevate the needs related to the opioid crisis and propose strategies to address this critical issue. Uh, and tonight we have Ms. Becky Copeland, who is here from the committee, to present um, a uh, impact of the crisis on Mitchell County and recommended the strategies. Uh, she also has uh, some of her colleagues who are joining by Zoom who may chime in from time to time. Please come Thank you um, so much. I'd like to say um, good evening to the um, chair, to all of our board here at Edgecombe County, to the manager of um, community members. Thank you so much for allowing the opportunity to speak um, to you tonight around our opioid crisis and settlement funds. Um, I'm here uh, as the uh, coordinator of our Twin Counties partnership and back to uh, County managers at this point. We do have colleagues on um, virtually uh, to chime in if you need to be as I present to you as a non clinical person, but with the good fortune of being surrounded by um, very well able, competent uh, clinicians available for us if you have further questions. And if I could point out, um, you'll see there's a presentation on the screen there. It's not copy in your, um, in your agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the first 
um, slide that I'd like to share with you tonight is state level data that speaks to the increase um, in overdose deaths in North Carolina um, in 2021 compared to 2020. You will see that on the state level that overdose deaths increased by 27 percent. Um, in 2020 alone, compared to 2019, there was a 15% increase. And due to the impact of the pandemic, we saw in this state a catastrophic, a catastrophic rate of 26% increase in overdose uh, deaths from 2019 to 2021. You will note that the three major contributing substances being unspecified narcotics, heroin, and then commonly prescribed uh, opioids. Did you say 26 percent? In the state, I'm sorry, 46 percent um, during the time of the pandemic in North Carolina. Is that what we're asking, sir? Yeah. Okay. Uh, here in Edgecombe, you'll see that ED visits for drug overdoses increased at least 15% uh, from 19 to 2020. And that Edgecombe has the highest rate, has one of the highest rates of drug overdose ED visits in the state. Uh, Nash and Wilson struggles as well, very much so. With, they saw a 27% increase in Nash, with Wilson showing a 31% increase in ED uh, visits from overdose. You'll see here, when we bring it back regionally compared to the state, Edgecombe County increased uh, in 2019 from 163.2 one, per 100,000 residents for ED overdose rates. Uh, it increased in 2020 to 188.5 per 100,000 residents. With Nash and Wilson also, uh, all three of us above the state rate for ED uh, overdose. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Bob. You're saying 100,000, we don't have 100,000 people in Edgecombe County, so can we really say those numbers are correct? Uh, our uh, data was gathered from our team. Uh, it was pulled from some local and state uh, level data, and um, I, I have them available to answer the advanced sources. But they split out the ratios according to one per There were 100,000 residents who have the same genes. We want to have it. That's why I'm saying the number is not. It's all for you. Okay. So these are emergency department visits? Yes. How do we know? So everyone that goes to the emergency department in Tarboro, let's say, not necessarily has some kind of president. All right. So do we know how many Edgecombe County residents have actually? Um, that, that's not uh, separated in this data per se. Um, it's the uh, data that's collected is to do with the EB visits to so It just so happens that it's at our department, but we don't know the home resident of those people. Not in this state. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, again, in regional data here, our EMS reports over 50% um, of overdose patients who they are seen and re are resuscitated by emergency workers. They refuse to be transported to, uh, to be transported to the ED. And then we know that the people at highest risk for overdose deaths are those who have overdosed before. We want to share with you a list of existing um, efforts that are ongoing across Edgecombe County. Uh, you'll see we have uh, people from rural health groups to uh, local service providers, providers for substance <coughs> misuse. We have area of AHEC, um, Biden Hospital. Just want you to be aware of a group of people. There are already some boots on the ground and doing their part as best as possible with our current reality to try and confront um, this very serious crisis. 
uh, other efforts uh, combined with that part only is our um, core, um, the reestablishment of core, doing a great job coming together, pulling partners together to try to uh, brainstorm around what um, helps might be for our communities here at Edgecombe. Our Twin Counties Partnership also hosts regular meetings and our effort is to try to share information, try to help people know um, as much as possible about existing efforts and then it also puts everybody in the space to try to brainstorm about around how we might fill existing gaps. So here are some of our efforts that are ongoing um, to the extent that we are able to do with the capacity that we also have. Noting Upper Coastal Plains Council of Government hired a full-time opioid navigator to try and help us on the <coughs> substance issues and that there's efforts trying to help businesses become aware of treatment resources. Um, other efforts trying to build systems to provide coordinated care for individuals at high risk of overdose, um, ensure referral for treatment recovery resources from the EMS and providers, want to increase um, for medication assisted um, therapies in primary care centers. <coughs> Still, here again, that is good news for us, the fact that we do have some efforts in place and I guess it's a matter of trying to figure out how to tighten the screws and then increase um, capacity for what's already existing. Um, helping to understand the substance use disorder is a chronic illness and it's not a medical moral failure. Working towards a stigma reduction and trying to increase options such as counseling and syringe services. Uh, these continue to serve clients in our communities. This I want to share with you is a story of a local resident here in the county. Um, this is a 30-year-old male who had a 10-year experience with substance um, use. And after many um, hardships and trials, you can see that this person had two prison terms that was served. And he got, um, he was treated with the uh, medication assisted uh, therapy. And then he has now been two years um, uh, in recovery, thankfully. You'll see that his life has turned to curve, that things are back on track that not only is he um, handling, managing his mental health disorders, but his uh, medical issues are being resolved as well. And this person is back to full-time employment. Share this experience because it is a, re a reminder for us that there is help and that success is possible. But I want to contrast that with the story of this person, another local person, who shares uh, how tough it is to receive uh, treatment here in the county. Uh, this person states that there is really nowhere to run. It's just nowhere to go. It's like you're looking for help, and it's like all the doors. It feels like all the doors are closed, or the doors are too far away to be open. We really need something in this environment. The desperation of this person says that I want a sponsor in this area. Because this place, I have one in another um, area, and I need someone close by that we could just get up with and go talk to any time. I need someone close. The virtual groups are good, but it's not like hands-on. So I want you <coughs> to know that success is possible, but the struggle is still real for those who are still in the middle of this challenge and want to think about that there are so many families here and in our surroundings that are still in the thick of it just as this community member was. I uh, wanted to think about efforts moving forward here, like the opportunity to share data so that we could track progress. That would be something that would be very beneficial for it as we move because the data can help us know how we are progressing. Uh, notions around psychiatric care for co-occurring behavioral health issues. Uh, outreach systems uh, for people who overdose 
who don't proceed uh, to care. Think about when our EMS workers say that 50 percent after their resuscitated will not come for further care. Just think about the opportunity for outreach programs that can go and help and bridge that gap for us. Um, we are looking towards peer support activities and jobs during recovery case management, along with a list of other things that we think could help move the needle of success when we're talking about uh, substance use and misuse. I want to remind you of collaboration being the key to preventing individuals from, problem, from falling through the cracks. And that we believe that holistic care ensures client success. And what holistic care will look like for us is that we are able to have peer, family, and community support. That there is opportunity for employment and education. And that our community members can have access to case management to help tailor plans specific to that individual uh, needs. Um, building sustainable and re uh, referral systems is very important looking down the road for long-term uh, peer support uh, and employment opportunities. These are the things that we believe can be game changers as we move forward trying to figure out how to address opioid. Um, crisis and other substance um, misuse in our counties. So my real purpose for standing here and trying to just give this bit of insight to you as a body, a governing body here in Edgecombe, to say that we have many service providers and community members. We consider each of them a part of a solution. We don't find one of us with a total package. And what we would really like to ask you is to consider, as you're moving forward with the opioid settlement that has been allotted for your county, if you would just consider the voices of a broader community. Hopefully that would include the service providers. We, we kind of assembled in our collaboration a group of, um, a prepared group of experts around uh, substance use and misuse. And then there are people who are in direct contact with community members who've lived this experience and they can give great insight as to what a real action plan could look like in addressing um, this crisis. So again, just to thank you again for allowing us your ear to ask if you would just consider just the opportunity to listen to broader voices as you make your strategic plan towards this recovery effort. Any other questions for me? I say we do have clinical people available if you have additional questions. Thank you so much. So should I have this case with my child, what would be the first place I should, I should go? I live here in Edgecombe County. Mm -hmm. If you had this situation with your child or family member, mm -hmm. that is a great question. That is a great question. Let's see if one of our, because um, I think that's the nuts and bolts of it all. It is exactly what is specific to your situation. It's how we would want to direct your referral, right? We would want a referral place in the process that is specific to what your family needs because there isn't a, a one size, like, but what is the most direct way to the need that your family member has. And so that will come with knowing what the situation is and then a strong referral network that we could outsource that to. And that, that would be in our best hope what we could develop. Uh, there are some services, and, and that's the thing that the partnership and our different partners work, how a lot of times we have existing services, but people don't even know what's available in their area. So we work to identify those, and then we try to uh, identify where the gaps are, and then work together to try to improve the gaps, how do we close those gaps where services are needed. So that's a great question, and like I say, that is my off-the-cuff answer for our day-to-day -day experiences. We have clinicians if you prefer them to answer, but here again is a robust support, a, a robust referral uh, system in place that in a matter of a 
a couple of minutes, we can determine what your family member's need is and then direct that in the appropriate way for the best outcomes. Next question. Do we have uh, specifics? Do we know the demographics of here in Edgecombe County or by race? We got OBI properties. <clears throat> Is there a specific area of the county that there's a, a greater increase than others? Um, our data people here get our data team could definitely pull that. We were just trying to get something more compacted, um, more condensed for the commissioners tonight. Uh, that's definitely data that we can get to you. Uh, I can check to see if they have it available, then we can see it. Or if they're specific, ask them. We can definitely get back to work on that for you. Give it to you. Thank you. I also wanted to say to our board that we should be grateful that we are part of the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners because we would have never known about this had they not come up at our board meeting, where some of the counties had filed a lawsuit about the opioids, and instead of just those counties getting the funding, it's been spread across to all 100 counties. And they didn't have to do that, but we're appreciative um, that we were added to that. So that's why I asked that we know certain parts of the county where we have more of a problem than other counties. And, and for sure, our service members know that there are certain therapies that are more common and more impactful in certain populations than others. That's why I say we carry a part of a solution, each of our providers but how to bring everybody together and share insight as to what a more robust and impactful solution is. That is the part that we still need further discussions, more insight, more information to help develop a, a well thought out plan. Yes, sir. Did I not see where I'm going to say that North Carolina would get $2.68 million dollars I know so I'm sorry. That is your Edgecombe County. Edgecombe County. The 2.86 million is the Edgecombe County allotment. But it's going to be spread over a 16 year period. Yes, sir. With the front load uh, coming within the first um, two or three years, in the first two years or three years, it is front loaded with a, <clears throat> with a heavier uh, portion. Um, in the first three years, I think it is, and then the allotments um, continue across the rest of it. And that's why it was so important to us to know that since we have the luxury of a 16, 18 year old period for grants to be uh, spreaded across, like knowing that those funds will be in place, how do we get the most impact in a way that 18 years down the road, Edgecombe County looks very different with regard to substance um, misuse and abuse. How do we turn the tide? How do we anchor this with other efforts that are going on that creates just better solutions overall in our county with regard to substance misuse? Yeah, so the, the two point five six eight six um, that's the Edgecombe County portion because it's distributed according to um, what your um, your opioid numbers were in the particular counties. Yeah, but if not, I think the board welcome uh, any recommendations from the committee as to how we might do so far. How we might I said the board welcomes recommendations from your committee. That's how we might use those funds. Thank, thank you. We, we've been uh, very fortunate in communications with uh, County Manager Evans here. He's been very open, and I, I know that um, Edgecombe County, um, it, just the fact of how he was so open, knowing what this means to your county and, and the importance where, where it fits on your agenda also. He's just been so open to us and the meetings here again with the reinstitution of uh, CORE, uh, which is your Edgecombe County Coalition. Uh, those partners right there are already collaborating and what things that we can do as a, like the Twin County partnership, we just like distributing information 
and how do we work with the intention of bringing people together. So the partnership sets in a neutral space to try and improve whatever efforts and support efforts across the county. Right. So uh, if there are additional things that we can get by way of data, um, then we'll happily pull that together because that was what we were wanting is to have a group of experts already prepared for you. And I've come from rural uh, counties and I know that most of the time that doesn't happen. And the tendency is that when money drops, you pass it over to the quick place to get rid of it. I mean, it's, it's through a channel that's in place and it's easy to pass over, but to make it impactful in situations like this because of the complexity of the issue, broader voices can help to give us a better action plan. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, if, if I could add, and so um, I'm very appreciative of our working relationship with the Twin Counties Partnership. And so, as she said, you know, we have an alignment that's set as uh, earmarked for Edgecombe County. Uh, our annual allocation will range somewhere between $150,000 to $200,000 a year over the 18 year period. And so, as she mentioned, uh, CORE, which was you know, started a few years ago by the Sheriff's Office and the Health Department with other partners, EMS and, and other partners at the table. Um, we have revived that. So that's going to be your group here that will make final recommendations to this board. And having a partner like the Twin Counties uh, Coalition, they bring a, a, a broad uh, range of opinions and voices uh, we have representation that attends their meetings, and so we appreciate that working relationship. Um, but as we get closer to when we expect to actually start receiving those funds, we've already, uh, our group, board, we've already been meeting to talk about recommended uh, strategies, and it includes some of which have been recommended by this group. But uh, as we approach, get closer to our expected receipt of the first allocation of those funds, we'll be bringing back a recommendation to this group. Does it cost us anything to pay this group here? We yeah. get all 2.6 million to yeah. choose as we see fit based on recommendations? No, sir. No, no. You say it cost us Yeah, we, are we have to spend any money out for administration of that grant. Yeah. They come to all of us and we decide to make the final. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then what we'll likely expect to happen is that um, we'll likely bring back a recommendation to you um, to distribute that over a few different strategies. So there might be some that will go to a particular provider. There might be some that we decide that we want to use some of it to have a um, have a navigator in house specifically with Bridgecombe County. Um, so it'll be some that we might see used in house. It might be some, likely be some that we'll recommend that we distribute to some outside organization to administer some strategy that we all agree that is important. It'd be nice if we could take a lump sum or a period of time and let us just use the earnings off of it in perpetuity. Because a lot of that will turn around and 2.6 will be gone. Yeah. Well, 18 years are, are go by quickly. And again, as Ms. Copeland said, that's why it's important for us to be as strategic as we possibly can. Um, I, I don't plan to be working here 18 years from now, but uh, whoever it is, hopefully we can look back and see that that money was strategically invested and the needle was moved in this particular process. But you made a comment that we would get this front loaded, so we could get a majority of the money in the first 10 years. Right, it, the, the annual appropriation will be more on the front end and then it will it'll trail off a little the later. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Next introduction of Mr. Wells. Yes, sir. Good evening. It is indeed my honor to introduce to you tonight a young man by the name of Connor Pitt. Connor is seated next to his dad, Craig Pitt. Uh, in regards to that honor, uh, I had a wonderful opportunity of uh, instructing uh, Connor's mom for a couple years over at Edgecombe Community College who became a graduate respiratory therapist, did a great job in the field, went back to uh, a family nurse practitioner school after coming to RN, and is now uh, an instructor over the National Community College. Uh, Connor, if you will allow me to tell a little bit about 
your dad before we get you. Uh, Craig is also uh, a paramedic serving over in Halifax County, and he's also worked here in Angel County. Thank you so much for uh, the services of his mom and his dad. Now at Connor. The reason Connor isn't here tonight is, let me say first of all, Connor had choices like many of us do. Connor is from Truth 587 over in the, uh, the representing the West Edge Cone Royalty Club. Uh, Connor is working on his citizenship in communities merit badge. And I believe I'm correct in saying that uh, after he gets this merit badge, uh, Connor, you might go for your citizenship in the state, citizenship in the nation, and citizenship in school. All I can say is thanks be to Scott. Uh, Connor, to make you feel a little bit more at home tonight, let me say this to you. Uh, this is our Commissioner Billy Wooten. Uh, Mr. Wooten's son, uh, Will, uh, just uh, recently achieved the level of an Eagle Scout. Uh, he was here at a meeting virus a while back, and they, let me just tell you, Will has done some wonderful, wonderful things that raised thousands and thousands of dollars for a local fire department here in Edgecombe County. Uh, so you see where I'm going? We're looking to you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing I want to say to you, Connor, is also our Chairman Wiggs. Chairman Wiggs' son, at once upon a time, was a little boy, uh, a little young youth like you, who is now our Edgecombe County Judge Lamont Wiggins. So uh, what a wonderful job Scouting does for our youth. And Connor, we just want to say to you, we know uh, we know where you live, we know where you reside, and it's just uh, it's just about this far from the Edgecombe County line and go there in Nash County. So if you had a choice to go to Nash County, uh, to, to their commissioner's meeting, you had a chance to go to a school board, school board meeting. All I want to say is, Connor, welcome, congratulations, and we're so glad to have you. I don't have to ask, but before he leaves here, fellow commissioners, would you please stop by and say hello to Connor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
we only had, I think, 63 cases, which was a blessing. <laughs> Especially for our staff who's having to keep up with it. So we're still still unfortunate that we've had 63 cases today, um, but we have come a long way from when we were coming in with hundreds and staff having to work on the weekends to try and keep up. <coughs> I am sad to report, though, today we've had 136 deaths due to COVID. In the last few months, we've had nine new deaths. So that is very unfortunate. The group that was most affected by COVID deaths is white men aged 75 years of age and older. And with that being said, what I'm going to report in just a minute, that age group is our most vaccinated. That's I believe it's 74%. 75 and older are fully, or what they you know, we consider fully vaccinated. Now they say two doses with a booster. Still continuing to provide COVID testing. Uh, during the month of February, the National Guard will be conducting drive through testing Monday through Thursday from 10 to 2 at our Rocky Mount location in the parking lot. And we're sad to report that uh, effective February 28th, National Guard will no longer be with us. Year has been a huge um, part of us being able to test, being able to vaccinate, help us run our clinics. Um, but that, that is coming to an end. They're needed elsewhere throughout the state. Could you repeat that day? February 28th will be the last day. Right now, right. Oh, Monday through Thursday from 10 to 2 out the parking lot. And Optum Serve is still here on our behalf. We're still providing testing in Pine Tops and Brownsville. So looking at our vaccines, um, today 53% of people are vaccinated with at least one dose. 49% are vaccinated with two doses or one dose of J&J. &J. And a little under 10,000 people have now received a booster or, or an additional dose. The FDA and CDC will soon be reviewing data on vaccines for children ages six months to four years of age. So that is something that we're starting to talk about to see how we're going to, we don't anticipate having a ton of people come in wanting vaccines for that age group. Um, we thought we would have a little bit more for that age five to 11, we have not. Um, one of the things that we have to be prepared for is the pharmacies, they cannot vaccinate um, anyone younger than three years of age. So if anyone you know, six months to three years old, they're definitely going to need to go somewhere to a provider, like the health department or a local provider. So the age group with the highest percentage for receiving at least two doses is age 65 to 74 with 74%, and age 75 and older is 75% vaccinated. We have reduced our vaccine clinics um, down to one day a week. Uh, we've had a drastic decline in requests for vaccines. So therefore, we are now doing our vaccine clinics on Fridays from 9 to 4 at both locations. And our clinic upstairs is now fully functioning Monday through Thursday for all other services. And as you start to hear those masks, everyone has the bag today. Um, three masks in there, the N95s. Um, the state started to distribute those out to local health departments. They did it a percentage based off population, not sure where they got the formula from. They sent the human, our human services building 9,400 masks split between the health department and DSS to distribute to 48,000 citizens, give or take, of Edgecombe County. So when we got that shipment, we had to decide, you know, what are, how are we going to get, these, you know, just a little bit of mass to as many people as possible. So we had decided to start with one mass per person per week is what we just started to distribute. We were also asked to be able to distribute them to the jail, to homeless shelters, to community centers, senior citizens, um, anywhere else that was in need of churches. Um, so we were supposed to spread out 4,700 masks on that. Um, so we did, fortunately, we were able to request more masks. We did. We, as soon as we could, we asked for 5,000 more masks, received them pretty quick, and started to distribute three masks per person. 
So that's where we are at now. In both locations, um, here in Tarver and in Rocky Mount, we do have masks available for the community to come in and get. That is my report. Yeah. Okay. First, let's talk about his home test that nobody knows who he got. Um, so what is, hypothetically, uh, a person has a problem? We're going to go on good faith, go on good faith. I mean, how do you know that they're not friendly? I get it. How do you know I'm not in it? I don't tell them. You don't. So you you don't. Just, so some, some employers yeah. choose not to accept the home test. Um, because it is hard to give confidentiality. Um, you have the rules that you have to follow as well. Um, but it's hard, so how are they going to prove to you? One, it's their test. How are they going to give it to you? That it's not someone in their household or a friend that they said, hey, take this test, so I, you know, get out of work. Get out of work. Okay, secondly, um, pregnant women who have COVID, and then they have the baby who has COVID, who have COVID. That's what happens. Um, um, situation just last week. Baby was three weeks old with COVID because he got it contracted with um, mom. But you don't start vaccinating until it's not. It was just emergency approval. They haven't they even approved it yet officially. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are looking at FDA and CDC is looking at emergency approval of vaccinating six months to four year olds. Okay, but that hasn't even been approved. So it's three weeks. Old baby just, just pregnant. Yes, okay, I was just wondering how that works. Okay. That's all. We're here. Do we keep up with the hospitalization rate of Edgecombe County citizens who are in the hospital solely because of COVID, no matter where they are in the hospital? We do not. It, we do not. They do not break down the data for us. Um, UNC NASH shares how many are in the hospital due to COVID, how many are in ICU, but they do not specify what counter, county residents they live in, neither does by an edge home. So when you reported hospitalization rates on the data sheet here, that is, where is that? This is, this is from the state, um, the, those numbers. So I'm not, on, I don't know which hospital, I, well, on here, this should be for Edgecombe County. That's what I'm yes, sir. This should be for Edgecombe County. The one there is an email that goes out from Thomas Stubner, I believe Mr. Evans shares with you um, on Wednesdays that by Edgecombe share with us. They did not break down for us. Is that hospitalization within Edgecombe County or Edgecombe County residents who may be hospitalized wherever they may be? Like I know a gentleman just passed away yesterday who was in, I think, Chapel Hill, who was an Edgecombe County resident. I believe it is where they passed with their initial. Um, okay. Somebody else No, it's reported back. The state data is reported back to your county. So oh. if someone passed in Chapel Hill, it would be reported in Edgecombe. And there's any way our health department can keep up with hospitalization rates of Edgecombe County citizens who are solely in the hospital due to COVID? We could try. Um, you know, we, we would have to get in touch with the hospital and have them have that just seems just like a better process than just positivity rates and no home tests. I mean, we didn't try to see how healthy our community is based on who's actually in the hospital, which is just good. Yeah, unfortunately, with staffing, it is hard. We've, we've been fortunate enough to find somebody in the supply system that would actually give us, you know, how many are in the hospital and the folks are, you know, in on a weekly basis um, and trying to find someone. We could, we can, we can certainly you know, ask them to see if we can find some how to break it down. Um, I think it was last week or the week before when we had 26. Um, you know, and half of those people hadn't even gotten a room yet. They were, those were in the hospital waiting to be admitted. Um, and so, but then, so their staff is really overwhelmed. I have no problem asking them if they can break it down. <clears throat> Does that mean they were there just with COVID only, or were there with some other illness that just had to access to COVID? I'm, COVID I'm not sure if some of them probably had comorbidities, but they were there being admitted for COVID. Any other questions? Uh, I received my four phone tests. Um, the senior citizens who received 
would, would someone at the health department be able to teach them how to use it? It is not an easy thing to do. I just got mine in the box. <laughs> but, I mean, could a, senior come, could a senior bring theirs to the health department somebody show them how to use it? We do, we have not received, I, I have not seen it come to us. I, I'm not familiar with what people are receiving. I have not received it myself. We don't receive it at the health department. Um, all our tests, tests go to lab or they go to a lab to be processed. Um, we certainly could try if someone has, you know, we have to make sure, first of all, they weren't, they can't come in if they think they're positive. So, you know, we, that's why we test the drive through if we don't test inside. So we have that too, you know, we have to, um, we can maybe guide them over the phone, but. I, I would suggest that if someone does not feel comfortable or capable of administering a test at home, they should rely on some other you know, testing, like come to the health department to be tested, or go to one of the other testing sites to be tested. Yeah, my husband said, they don't trust that box. Just don't probably get out. If a person doesn't feel comfortable using I would work mine, I haven't got mine here, so I have no idea what it looks like. But you know, I think that that's a can be a useful tool, but certainly it may not be for everyone. And that's why testing is still available through us at the health department as well as other places. So I guess I would recommend if someone does not feel comfortable administering that to themselves, they should probably rely on an outside provider to do that. It's similar to the, like the rapid test. You know, we um, when you administer a rapid test, you're supposed to follow up with a PCR test, which is a lab confirmed test. Um, so you have to kind of take it for what it is. You know, the home test, and if you feel like you are symptomatic, you don't really know how to use that test. But Mr. Evans said we would encourage you to go and get tested somewhere and get a PCR test done. Well, I would say that this is your first appearance for us as the health director. <laughs> And they're asking a lot of them, which seems like the time is pretty good, okay? <laughs> they're putting a lot on you to request, okay? That's so, yeah, you are handling it well. You say, I'm going to try. I say, I'm going to try, okay? So you're doing a good job, okay? Thank you. <laughs> so, Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions before we give them another sound? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We had uh, three people to uh, call and ask to be to come before you tonight. The first is Mr. Darius Swinton, uh, who is here. I'd like to. What's your name now? Please take your name. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Darius Swinton from Richmond, Virginia. To Commissioner Williams. Mr. Board members and uh, Mr. Evans, who was so kind, had an initial conversation with a few months ago. Mr. Understanding the patients and that to come. Also, I'd like to give a special acknowledgement to Mrs. Mungo, who was uh, extremely uh, patient with me throughout my international travels and had to reschedule because of weather and other commitments. Uh, I say greetings to everyone. It's truly an honor just to be able to come and be here uh, tonight. I uh, understand on the agenda, I'm limited to three minutes, I'm going to do my best to try to... You have a rhythm of doing I am. Thank you so very much. <laughs> but I think it's critically important to try to honor all the ground and say the same word, say the word, thank you. I have basically two objectives and one request. Uh, the first objective is to return two checks that were sent to me um, in the finance department, one from uh, Edgerton County and one from Rocky Mountain. I want to return these two checks. Uh, Yet to cash them, so I will apologize to Mr. Evans. The, that's the first objective, and that's easy to accomplish. The second one is to um, try to raise your level of awareness and understanding regarding the experience I've been having for the past, I want to say now about five months, trying to get some clarity in two departments I think of critical importance to the functioning and the operations of, of city and county government. I have a handout for you if I can uh, listen for the conditions only. Yeah, you don't have it. Yeah, thanks for the reminder. Oh, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the reminder. I'll talk 
about 13 years ago, I purchased some property that's divided between the Edgerton County and Rocky Mountain. Consistently and faithfully, when I got a bill from each uh, district, I paid it by way of a check for 13 years. At the end of 13 years, being 14 years last year, I sold the property. At that time, I learned that I was paying more than I should have been paying per year for 13 years. I brought that to the um, attention of your leadership in Edgerton County, Rocky Mountain, who's, I think, in the tax assessor's office. Was I able to get any clarity, but I was able to get some factual information from two employees, one from each, saying that a mistake was made, but they would never come public and, uh, and say that, that a mistake was made, because each year, from my limited understanding, as a former state government uh, official, that an assessment or an evaluation should be done to validate the property, the size, and, and the tax cost. My limited understanding that was not done consistently, which led to me paying more than enough money every year. The this, this sheet I just passed out, you see that when I paid for city tax beginning 2007 up to 2020, all I paid when I paid in county tax, 2007-2014. Therefore, I paid uh, uh, more than 3,000, I paid approximately $3,063.08 more than what I should have paid. The only reason why else I've gotten thus far, everyone, is that there's a statute that says you have six years limitation to find the fault and try to get it rectified through city government. Six years. Because I was not aware of the statute, and because the person who was in that leadership position took the position to try to find the statute, the send it to me, which I'm very grateful for, they said, we cannot reimburse you. Because there's a six year limitation. I said, I consistently, as a customer, paid the bill. Paid it. But now that I found the error, I cannot be reimbursed for the overpayment. That's my concern. I provided services on the city, state, federal, international level. I've done work for many other agencies throughout the country and throughout this world. And I am somewhat concerned about the lack of accountability and professionalism that has been targeted towards me in my last four or five months, just trying to get some constructive resolve on why that is so, that is being held against me that I paid more money than what I should have been paying. And whoever was responsible for doing those assessments, I wish I had access to the paperwork to see who's employed at the time because that person should have done an assessment, checked the box, that yes, it was 17.7 acres instead of 20 point whatever acres that's documented in front of me. I like to get some resolve because at that level I was dealing with, at the uh, city and county level, the person I was dealing with, I did not get any factual information to really validate why that is so other than the statute. But in being a, a, a former state uh, administrator, I'm very much aware of statutes. And this statute works to the favor of the government. Just read it. It totally works to the favor of the government and not the customer who I've been faithfully, consistently for 13, 14 years. Mr. Peters, can you help me with it? Yes, sir. You may remember, um, Mr. Swayden, but you may remember that Mr. Swayden made a request to the board back in August of 2021. I believe it was August, I'm correct. But he brought this attention, brought this request to the board to be reimbursed for that portion of the taxes he paid for those years. The property was assessed at about 20 acres. He learned, I believe, when he sold the property to the buyer survey that it was actually a little over 17 acres. The, the tax office, and this will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, but the tax office does not assess property annually. There's an you know, uh, assessment done every seven or eight years. The tax office does not go out and survey everyone's property. Uh, Mr. Swinton is absolutely right that the statute does come into play. As you well know, the county is only authorized to do what it is authorized to do by statute. And there's a statute, uh, 105381, that addresses taxpayer remedies, and that was the statute we discussed at your meeting when this request was made. And there are very limited circumstances where a taxpayer can get a refund for taxes that are paid. And the, there are only three, is when there's a tax imposed by a clerical error, an illegal tax, or a tax levy for an illegal purpose. 
this was falls under the declaratory error category. However, as he said, there is a limit to that. It's actually five years by the statute. So this board took action on that request to refund Mr. Swinton those portion of the overpayment taxes for those five years back to that meeting. And that was the most the board was allowed to do. Uh, you may remember that conversation. I think there was some step by the fee toward Mr. Swinton, but the, the board is limited by the statute. I do remember the conversation about that. But that conversation had a board meeting and the board certainly asked Mr. Peterson, our town attorney, was there any way for us to reimburse you? And we did that according to uh, what the statute allowed us to do. Now, uh, you, you state you are a government, and you've been a government employee. And really, we were looking for a way to pay you because well, we thought you would do it, OK? But it's just that based on the statute, we could not pay you because the General Assembly has said that we could based on the statute that they passed. And that is the reason that you got what you got from checks from us. And we do set those, uh, uh, we do have a miss, uh, uh, we assess the proper way. We, we do evaluation every eight years, is that correct? Yes, sir. But the evaluation wouldn't have caught that, would it? Yes, sir. With evaluation, we do evaluation every eight years. So the revaluation notice has the acreage and the value in the field process. Okay. Change, notice okay. Change. But I don't think she said the revaluation would call the error, but it would have been an opportunity for the owner to recognize the error. Okay. And, and, and that's where we are in terms of what we were authorized, what this board was authorized to pay. That's the way we understood it based on what we understood the law to be. That's the but if the board could have done otherwise, this board would have paid you. But we, we felt that we could based on the statutory, like based on the statute. We did have a, uh, we did have a more than, we had a long discussion about that and ask our attorney to look for others. Was there any statute that we could give you the full amount of? And he said that he couldn't find it. That's it, I think it's over a Sir? I want to return these checks. Well, we can return these checks, sir, if I may. You can give me a and give them back to Mr. Peterson. Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, sir? A personal and professional integrity. And I'm allowing you to sell this at this time. They would have done the assessment, documented after eight years. They would have informed me. I was not informed after eight years. Well, I'm sorry that we couldn't, but we've done what we consider to be our statutory responsibility. I believe that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Evaluation was done. He got he had nothing to give it to him, Sean. Doing a revaluation? Oh yeah, he, he, he would have gotten notice of the property that he owned in the county, a description of the property. Had there been anything about the property that he owned he felt like was incorrect at the time, that was an opportunity for him to come and raise that to our awareness. Just like any other taxpayer, you know. If, 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 if the assessment says that there is three bedrooms and there's only two, or there's, says it's a porch and it's not a porch, that's, that's an opportunity. Uh, well, really, every year is an opportunity when the, when the tax you know, uh, value goes out. That's an opportunity for folks to bring any discrepancies to our attention. At that particular time, it's a greater opportunity to do that. And so that would be an opportunity that had been recognized by the property owner to bring it to our attention. And we don't, we do not, as has already been said, we do not disagree that there was not an error. It has been corrected, but unfortunately, the statute does not allow us to go back. And what, what to me, what the statute says, you've got an opportunity to catch this within five years. That's you don't catch this within five years, it is on you, the land. That's what the statute tells us. 
he didn't catch it until the 14 hit. Until he sold the property. Until he sold the property. Right. So he didn't even know he was over there. Next petition. Um, Ms. Candace Owens has asked to address the board tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My name is Candace Owens. I live in, on Park Avenue, Tarboro. And I, I, I'm coming tonight because I didn't finish last time. I gave out of time. I felt like my welcome was worn out. Uh, I asked the dog is never one I ask I ask you if you all gave yourselves a raise this past year. And you did, but no one could answer how much or what percentage. Well I found out that the chairman got uh, a seventeen percent raise. Everybody got a hundred and fifty dollars except for Mr. Wooten who declined the stipend. So the chairman got a 17% raise up to $880 a month. Uh, the rest of you got a 21% raise up to $728.39. The state employees got a 2.5% raise. The first time in probably, I think, three years. Uh, the sheriff's department has been begging for a raise. The school system needs so much. I just think that a 17% and a 21% raise is extraordinary. And I think there are better places to put that money, uh, such as the sheriff's department, for our safety. I, I was on the town council. I know you don't get enough money. Uh, if you got $80,000, it probably wouldn't be enough money. But um, I wish you would think about that again and reconsider. Uh, when Sharon Edmondson's here, she st stated that 2018-2019, uh, she who is the secretary of the LGC and a deputy treasurer for the state and local government finance division of the NC State Treasurer's Office, said that Edgecombe County had reported material weaknesses. He accounts do not reconcile. Several requirements of the NC statute, general statutes were violated. Several funds reported deficits, extensive budgetary over expenditures. Budget. What is the budget? I've never seen the budget. I've never asked to see the budget. But I do understand that there are budget amendments at just about every meeting. And I want to ask you to look carefully at the budget and the budget amendments. We've got to stay within the budget. We have to live within our own budgets, even our own budgets. My understanding is that there are no performance evaluations given to the county employees. How can you possibly reduce the payroll if there are no performance evaluations? And with our census down 13.5% or 7,652 people, we're going to have to cut the payroll some way. We've got to, we've got to cut some money. We've got to save some We've got to find some money and stop spending money. The, uh, there is a county manager, assistant county manager, deputy county manager, and together they make $313,000. And then I tried to decipher all of this auditing, uh, all of the auditing bills, and the best I came up with, which included the $80,000 from last month, was about $204,000, and that included a $10,000 contract for assistance for the preparation of financial statements. Well, you put those two numbers together, and that's over half a million dollars. So that's a good starting place to, to cut some of this. Uh, the QBC 5 is going to figure into all of this. 
I don't know what that's going to do to our uh, tax base. We've got to change something, and we have to change it immediately. And I want you to give that serious thought as to how we can change the direction we're going because we're going south on a roller coaster. And, and we've got to stop it. It just, you know, this is not fair to the poor people in our poor county. Our tax base is the second highest in the state. It's higher than Northampton County, Washington County, uh, Berkeley County, Rosie County. We are, we are 95 cents on the hundred dollars. And I, I think I think it's Dose County. Don't quote me on that because I, I I don't know. But I want to encourage us to take a careful look. I want to encourage you to take a careful look at budgetary amounts and how we can save some money, make some money. If we have to pay back that 3.7 million dollars, which I hope we don't, I don't know where we'll go from. And we can't raise the taxes anymore. The poor people, I can't stand it. The poor people, I don't know, they, they live on what you may eat. Some of them. So thank you for your time. It's a real concern of mine. I'm so sorry that uh, I, I feel so strongly about this. I just want you to really consider your budget. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next we have Mr. Camilla Vance, who's asked to address the board tonight. It's obvious that Edison County Sheriff's Office is doing a great job 
They call a question, where was the child of police officers at the game? Someone told me that all of the sheriff officers were at the game. However, I also can be correct. I still hope the county can prevent QPC to reveal because these folks are taking a huge cut, pay cut from the salary they were making to the little unemployment that not come out of QBC has nothing to do with the amount of unemployment wages, so that was good when they paid them for several weeks at the salary they were making. I know the Echo County Commission, like other entities, have issues and challenges. However, I hope you will attend to my request. Thank you, you and the family. That's all we have that it called in the and, 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 and anybody email? No, sir. We received no. No further public petition. Moving on to other business, Mr. Uh, yes, sir. Item A of the other business, we see a number of uh, budget amendments. Um, and so I want to draw your attention to a few of them. I'm happy to answer questions about any of them. And just for clarification, as you know, uh, that most of these budget amendments, far the vast majority of these budget amendments, is not adding additional money to the budget. It is moving money from one line to another. And it is, so we have a balance budget. We have a balance budget. Okay. It's, it's very difficult for county organizations to attend to budget amendments uh, every month. Uh, the first one I want to draw your attention to is, the, is number one there in your packet. You'll see this is from Board of Elections. Uh, so the revenue account, that notes roll from FY21 general fund balance, just to make it clear that those were grant funds that were sent um, all in advance. This is, not a, this is not a reimbursement grant. So we received that grant last fiscal year. Not all of that grant was uh, expended. And so now we need to roll that balance over. And it's coming from fund balance because we had already received uh, those funds. So I just wanted to point that out. Is that why we were talking? Yes. The reason for, give us the reason for the amendment. Yes, sir. So at, at the very beginning of the fiscal year, or we're actually before the beginning of the fiscal year, by, you have to adopt the budget um, by June 30th of each year for the upcoming fiscal year. You set in place at that time total budget for the county. Not just the total amount, but every, uh, what is it allotted to every line item? We've got hundreds, I guess maybe thousands of line items, over 18 departments, and then a number of other uh, budget lines. And so that is a budget that, uh, through me, we are authorized to, uh, to administer. And so we cannot deviate from that budget unless you give us permission to. So. Uh, you know, for example, this this first one here, at, at the budget we have already adopted for this fiscal year, uh, it did not include uh, $19,000 of one-stop voting expenses in this particular line, or $8,584 in this particular line in the Board of Elections, or the appropriation from fund balance to cover those two expenditure lines. So until you do this, we cannot spend a dime out of these two lines right here. We are not authorized to do that. So, you know, you set a budget at the beginning of the year, and then changes have to be made. Sometimes it's rolling uh, from one line within an apartment to another. You might have an apartment head that, you know, we're all estimating at the beginning of the year. They might have estimated $5,000 for supplies, and as the year rolls on, they realize that's not going to be enough. So they might move uh, some from, from fuel or from salaries or whatever it might be. But they cannot spend that above five thousand in that particular line until this board votes to make that change to the budget. Very good. Um, number eight in your packet. I just want to draw your attention to, as you see, this is a this is for the Department of Social Services. These are additional funds. We did not have these uh, appropriated to us at the beginning of the fiscal year. $622,713. This is the Low Income Energy Assistance Program. Specifically, this is a pandemic uh, appropriation. So this is above what we typically get in appropriation for this program in social services. 
So you'll see there in that budget amendment, um, there is the, the revenue that is increased by that 622000 as well as that particular expenditure line. Um, item 9A. This is uh, this is for administration budget or budget, my budget, and I am asking for an, an additional fund balance preparation of twenty thousand dollars. This is increasing uh, my other professional services or contract services uh, line item in my budget. Uh, this is primarily due to some of the additional consulting costs that we have within our, our department for some of the things that we are working. On. Um, there is uh, one additional uh, budget amendment that you have at the table. It's number 19. And also for, for the public to understand, being that this board only meets once a month typically, uh, we have uh, that window to get these budget amendments before the board. Sometimes, and, and if, we, if it doesn't get on the agenda, otherwise it will have to wait until next month. And so you all have been uh, gracious and agreeable to allow us that if one comes up between the time that we finish the, the agenda package, which is usually on Friday morning, that some one comes up after we've already prepared the agenda or sent it out, um, and that happens, um, we ask that you consider adding these budget amendments so that we don't have to wait until the next, uh, next month's meeting. And you'll see this is one that's moving from uh, salaries to telephone in emergency services. And so if you agree to this to be added, this becomes part of the approved budget amendments uh, for tonight's meeting. And also, just so you'll be aware, these become a part of the official minutes that go in our minute book. So if anybody wants to come back and see all of the budget amendments that are approved in a given meeting, uh, Ms. Mungo, track of that, goes to our official minute book, and a copy of all of these budget amendments is included with those minutes. So uh, those are the ones I want to draw your attention to, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Any questions with that before I have a motion? Motion. So moved. Second. Second. Question. All in favor of that we don't have a vote. Aye. Aye. All opposed and none. The budget is all approved. Next one, please. Uh, item B, the IRS has uh, made a change to its uh, reimbursement rate for mileage uh, going up from 56 cents per mile to 58 and a half cents per mile. So I recommend that you approve our new mileage reimbursement rate at 58 and a half. Motion. Second. Second. Questions? All in favor, let me know that one side. Aye. has purchased new rifles for his deputies to replace their issued shotguns. Sheriff Atkinson is requesting your approval to allow deputies to purchase their current weapons. North Carolina General Statutes does allow the governing body to dispose of personal property owned by the county through a negotiated sale. I recommend that the board approves the tax resolution which will allow Sheriff Atkinson to offer these weapons for sale to his deputies. Motion. Yeah, see how much. It's negotiated. It's certainly as far as negotiated is going to do what we have to do. It doesn't have a high level. Any other questions? All in favor of that, you know, I'm going to say aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, you're approved. Appointment, we have ABC board. Uh, Mr. Chair, before you do that, I would ask that you'll consider adding to the agenda. You'll have that to place a supplemental agenda. Um, I and so, um, as you know, the Hitchcock County Schools, and we didn't get this in until Friday afternoon after the, the, uh, after the agenda had already been distributed. So the school plans to re uh, repaint the interior of their schools using funds from the North Carolina Lottery Building Capital Fund. To use these funds for this project, uh, this board must jointly request the release of those funds along with the Edgewood County Public School Board. Therefore, before you use the application for the Public School Building Capital Fund, which has already been approved by their board, I recommend that you approve this thing. You'll see it's in an amount of $148,590. Do we have one? So move second. Second. Question? Oh. 
Go ahead. Yeah, so it says estimated project beginning date 7 1 and for completion date June 30, 2021. That's last year. So are they saying we're just getting it now or they got the wrong dates? I had not noticed that my apologies. I believe that's project here. I will follow up with them on that. And rather than doing this painting, I'd like to see them have heat and air at all these schools. Is this the way you feel the Maintenance director. Didn't I see something from someone else? Here? He is the school system's maintenance director. We have a new maintenance director oh, that you're going to be. It was us. Okay. Gotcha. I got it. What can I say? You have a question? All in favor, let me know my boss. Not I. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Vote 61. Thank you. 
the DSX revenues, they appear low, but that's normal for this time of the year, catch up by the end of the year. Um, but it is actually about 3% higher than the last year this time. The health revenue is running a little higher than the were this time last year. It's about 7.5% more. Um, so overall, we collected 4% more in the revenues than we had at this time last year. On the expenditure side, um, I'll point out that the debt service appears very low. We do have some debt payments coming up. Majority of those for the land from economic development Kingsburg will be posted through so February. You'll see those on your report next month. And the remaining largest debt payments for in June, which include all of our water districts. So if you compare your overall expenditure to where we were last year at this time, ironically, it's that we spent about 4% less than what we would have had last, last year at this time. Knowing that our budget went up, um, we still spent dollar to dollar a little less than we had at this time. Time last year. Any questions? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
audits and our fiscal uh, improvements. And so the FY20 audit is very close to being completed. We are now uh, addressing some questions and additional information requests that we receive uh, from the auditor. We we'll hope to have that all done and wrapped up in the next few days. Um, once we do get the final draft of the FY20 audit, I would recommend that the we first call the budget of the budget committee to meet to give us the opportunity to present that to the budget committee. And then shortly after, I would recommend that um, that you have a special meeting so that the full board can get a presentation from the auditor of the FY20 audit. At this point, I don't know when I would recommend that to be, but I just wanted to give you the heads up so that we can hopefully wrap that up before the before your next meeting in March. But I may suggest that while you've got the budget committee together, get a date from them that they can if we can come back and, and call us, the rest of us, and we can try to date before they leave that budget committee, okay? Sure. Yes, sir. You can, you can go ahead and let's check with us. Yes, sir. And so uh, now we're in short rows, uh, so to speak, with FY20 audit. You know, the last few weeks, just about all of our attention and resources, the time and effort been poured into um, uh, doing what we, what we need to do on our side to get that wrapped up. Um, also, the auditor has started on the FY21 audit. Um, they were on site last week for two full days. And so we are still pressing to have that completed by the end of February, as, as you all have directed us to do. Um, in addition, I'd like to add that we have, uh, in, in addition to training that many of us have had over the course of years, uh, several of us attended some additional training here recently that was offered by the local government commission. Um, on, on our executive team, the four of us, uh, myself, and, uh, Ms. Bess, and Mr. Matthews, and Mr. Peters, attended the training as well as Catherine and three of her staff members attended that, and a number of you uh, commissioners attended that as well. So thank you for, for that. Um, we're continuing to work with, with our consultant, Ms. John Sharp, who is here tonight if you have any questions for her. Uh, throughout this process of finalizing the FY20 audit and you know, beginning to work on the FY20 audit, that is, it, that is enabling her to identify areas uh, to help uh, for her to make recommendations for us for internal improvements for uh, better efficiency so that we can get these done in a timely manner. So uh, happy to answer any questions. Again, she is here tonight if you have any questions. Any questions, so the Sanders or Ms. Sharp? I'd like to ask her if we're being cordial and showing you uh, Edge Coast County uh, recipe. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. <laughs> and any other comments from the board? Here, not moving on. Yes, so, you have to be also tonight an update on our sales tax report. And uh, finally, for my report, I want to introduce to you our new maintenance director. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Stan Liverman to come to the podium just so that everybody can get a good look at you. Um, and so, as you know, we, we, we have um, Mr. Mike Matthews. I want Mike to stand up because Mike, in addition to that, in addition to Mike being our uh, assistant manager, he was for a time both our interim uh, utilities director and our interim maintenance director. That was a tremendous load for him to carry. He has carried it very well. Uh, I know he was tickled to death. Paul is our new utilities director. You've met Paul before, and even more uh, happy now that we've got to stand here. But I just want to thank Mike publicly uh, for what he's been doing. Also, uh, you know, I know there's been discussion about as having a deputy and assistant, but I think it's important to know that these two have to be prepared that when these vacancies come up at a department head level, if we're not able to fill it immediately, they're asked to step in, and they do it willingly, at least when we're talking about it. Yes. <laughs> and, they, and they do a good job, because Ms. Best has also been, uh, she has been our interim uh, HR director. We now have an HR director, so she's still working her to transition into that is her transition now. So I want to thank them both, but we're very glad to have Stan on the team. He has hit the ground running, already doing a great job. So uh, thank you, Stan. Anything you want to say? Nothing other than I'm glad to be here, and I look forward to working with Mr. Evans, Mr. Matthews, Mr. Bettison, and the board, and everybody else in the county. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I have a suggestion on it, and that is, you know, they have been made some public concern about uh, us uh, and to the executive uh, team. And we have over 500 employees here. And my position is that the manager needs help in dealing with these departments. And I think this is about to use that's an excellent asset for this county. And they, those positions will continue to have my support as long as I say it. And I don't intend to die here, okay? But uh, they have my position for they to need. And those of us that supported this, we looked at our budget and this is our responsibility. And we saw it with the funding and that's what we did. You know, people can look at it from without, but it's our decision to develop what we think best for this team, this county, and that is what we have done. We will continue to have criticism, but it's, it's our responsibility to, to deal with it, and I think we've done that for our team. That's it for my report. So make sure report is taken to me. Okay. I just received an email today from uh, Mr. Ben Farmer. Ben is the uh, senior regional planner for the Upper Coast Plain County Government. And what he's just passed along to me is the fact that uh, on the 25th, and I'm just passing this out to the fellow commissioners when he puts this on the calendar. On your radio, February 25th from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Uh, there will be a webinar on how to use ARPA funding for digital inclusion projects. And if you're like me, if, out of all conversations that people approach me from the public about, I would say, hands down, if it's someone speaking with me about the inability to have internet services. And, uh, I just invite you to please, hopefully we can get some help from this, we've got some funding, and uh, this is a, a great need uh, of other, other committees that I serve on across the county. It's called and Ash, it's, it's a problem, and uh, we all need to look at this if we can, and to make sure that we do all that we can as commissioners to speed this process along. 25th, like 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. It, it, it's, uh, it's digital again. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send each commissioner. Well, I think you need to send to some of our staff okay, also so that. Um, I will. Uh, right. so okay. 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 And when I picked up the even telephone that day, I went to what I call the target page to see what they said after the meeting. Well, not only was I saddened by it, but I was also disappointed by it. The entire article focused on the fact that we were late over our office. I have no problem with that. I accept the criticism and they were doing their job. What I was so sad and disappointed about was that they did not feel that it was worthy to mention one truth that we recognize, Mr. Daniel Harrod, and the organizations that responded to the QVC facility fire. That night, we recognized that group and that individual for what, they, what they've done for our county, and I feel like they deserve that. There were over 100 organizations, I think, President Bob, been told, a lot of first responders and a lot of people that came. And Mr. Harrod took a bullet in his face to get somebody off the road to protect us every day. And I just don't understand why a local newspaper would not at least say that we pointed this out and we want these individuals to be recognized for what they did. It's sad and it's disappointing that these people were not recognized by a local newspaper, especially under the circumstances that took place. Not because the board of commissioners recognized it, that's our job, and we were willing and wanted to do it, but because they deserve it. 
and I am very disappointed that our media did not at least mention it as part of our commission here. We all need a little bit of good news. That's the good news. No, all the good, we accept it. We man up to it. We're doing what we need to do to take care of it. But there is no excuse for these in this individual, this group of people, for what they did, not even mention that a new part of it. And that's all I've got. I just want to get that Thank you. Oh, uh, um, I wanted to ask our attorney. Um, I serve several nonprofit organizations. Ones I believe in, like boys and girls, uh, you know, things like that. So I wanted to know from you, um, Senate Bill 473, taking that into consideration, should I be thinking that I should resign from all those nonprofit boards as an elected official? No, ma'am, I don't think so. As you saw in that Senate bill, it would be a conflict if you were to vote for any allocation made to the entity. Uh, and some of those entities may or likely are ones that are funded annually through the budget. And if that's the case, then we can pull out any appropriations to those entities and vote on those entities separately so that you can still vote on the annual, annual budget. That would apply to everyone. If there's a nonprofit board you serve on that is funded through the annual budget or any other time, then you, know, you, you can't vote on that. But it, the most likely scenario is it's through the budget, so we can pull those out and vote on those separately. The board can vote on those separately. <clears throat> Which means that you could make a mistake. It would be important and, and not and not put it out. It, it, it would be good right. practice. Yes, sir. It'd be good practice for well, the, the statute says a few intentions to do it. But it would be good practice for our board members to let Mr. Edmund be know what entities you are associated with. And the statute defines that so that we can be aware of any conflict. Now Mr. I'd like to have you had an update on I've got several calls. Have we had an update from the school board concerning those schools in Rocky Mountain on the Edgecombe County side, the $100,000 position that everybody was talking about, um, the public or relatives in Rocky Mountain, nobody's heard a thing. I want to know where are they. So we plan that will be an agenda item for your retreat. I think that will be a better setting because it will give us a little bit more time for you to hear because there has been a, a lot of work that's been done, a lot of um, people that have been talked to, Mr. Cannon. Uh, we met with him several times, and so he will be on the agenda for the retreat. He is working. He's moving around. He's yeah, I've heard he's been moving around. He's governor. Yeah. He's governor. I just want to make sure all are listening, because our constituents are asking us. I have heard words. Yeah. Attorney's report? No, sir. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. There's one thing I, I didn't have on the list I, I should have mentioned. Uh, you remember Community Voices Initiative that we rolled out several months ago. We had a number of things where we we're trying to improve our communication from our citizens and to our citizens. A, a number of things that we've been doing. Um, one of the things we talk about is planning to do a Citizens Academy. Uh, Larry Peters, who's our intern, has been working on that. Um, that's actually geared to start on February 22nd. Um, we were limiting it to 10 people because of COVID. We, were, we felt like it was best to have it in person, but we didn't feel like we could safely do it with more than 10 people. So we've limited it to 10 people. Right now we've had seven. So if there's anybody that's still interested, we've got three seats that are still available. And they will be on a number of topics uh, scattered throughout about an eight week period. And so just wanted you to know that, that we will soon be doing a citizens account. What, what date was it? The 27th? The, the first session will be on February 22nd. Okay. It will close to start tomorrow. That's right. That's right. And so we, there was slow sign-ups on it, so um, so we slid it back. Is it cool? We have three seats still available. So if you know someone who's interested. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we're scheduled to go into a closed session to discuss economic development. Okay, welcome to go into closed session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.